Hello and welcome to the Andrew Ferris Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode of the show. Today I have an interview with the great Jack Rubin, co-founder, co-CEO of Purdy and Fig, a monster subscription-based e-commerce business in the UK. I have had the great privilege of getting to work alongside Jack and his business in sort of a coaching capacity, basically. It's not a managed services client for me. We'll actually talk more about who he has worked with in that in a little bit. But Jack's business is an incredible business. It is one of the most fun businesses I work on because it has the dynamics of a subscription business uh, subscription business that are really unique in e-commerce. And if you've, if you've been around subscription businesses, you know the kind of things I'm talking about. How you think about acquisition relative to LTV and really getting serious about measuring that. And to Jack's credit, Jack has been really, really good about carefully measuring and thinking through the value of a customer at every level, deeply understanding how contribution margin works in his business. If you have heard me talk about those kinds of things in this show, I think this episode is going to be very useful to you to to get kind of a firsthand up close look at how somebody who is operating his business very effectively and building a serious, serious business is thinking about all of that, using it to, to steer the ship in his business. I will not delay any longer. Let's jump in with Jack Rubin. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. Jack, thanks for making time, man. I really, really appreciate it. You know I'm a big fan of yours and of your business. And and the other day it occurred to me like, wait, why haven't we done a podcast yet? This is like, there's so much good stuff to talk about from your business. And I think people will get a lot out of it. So thanks for thanks for taking the time. It's morning for me in LA at uh, it's about 9.15. What time is it for you? You're in London, right? Five, five, yeah, five o'clock for us um, in London. But um, no, it's a, it's a real honor. I mean, I actually love love this podcast. I just, it's one of my genuine regulars. The quality of content on here is pretty amazing. Well, nah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. And uh, what's what's life in London like right now? What's what's the weather like? What's going on in London? Yeah, it's weather's been not bad this summer. Yeah, sitting at twenty odd degrees, pretty good for over here. Not too rainy. It's good. Got my brothers. My brother and co-founder's wedding on Friday as well, so we got lots going on. I didn't know that was happening. Congratulations to Charlie. That's great. Let's talk about that really fast. So, give people a sense of Purdy and Fig and what the business is. Obviously, you can go purdyandfig.com, go check it out. Link is in the show notes, of course, so you can go see kind of what Jack's business looks like. But <clears throat> you guys are exclusively in the UK, so for all of my US listeners, which is most of them, they won't have had a chance to purchase the product really. But Give people a sense of what the business is. And then also, if you wouldn't mind talking about sort of the division of labor between you and Charlie as co-CEOs and co-founders, sort of what part of the business are you taking on? What part of the business is he taking on? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so as you said, we're um, we're a DC brand focused on, on selling you know, by e-commerce, basically. And we sell uh, cleaning products. I mean, the form- our cleaning product formulation was originally created by Purdy Rubin, who's me and my brother's mum, and a, a woman called Charlotte Fig, hence the name Purdy and Fig, who who weren't really setting out to kind of change the world or anything, but they they really wanted to create a cleaning product that, dare I say, made cleaning a bit more enjoyable um, or even tolerable. Yeah, it's something they they had been doing their whole lives basically, and I had a really clear sense of what what the problems were in cleaning and. The fact that clean products are toxic, made with toxic ingredients and toxic scents, synthetic scents. Um, They smell, that synthetic scent smells quite strong and nasty and not at all natural like a kind of candle. They're extremely unsustainable, obviously in plastic packaging often and shipped through long supply chains in supermarkets. And the way cleaning products are actually presented is extremely confusing. I mean, you've got 15 different products just for different services in your home, whether it's the wood, the stainless steel, the floor, your, your, your countertops, bathroom tops, or whatever it might be. And they were really fed up with having all these different products that you had to lug around the house in a big kind of cleaning box. And so they really came up with this pretty incredible and innovative formulation with, with a chemist, a PhD chemist, which is basically the kind of foundation for, for, our, for our business. Yeah, they're cleaning products that are designed to genuinely make cleaning uplifting and pleasurable. So you can take pride in, in doing the cleaning and take pride in your, your home and your surroundings. And that's really how the whole thing came about. In terms of how it works now, I mean, my, I run the growth 
growth side of the business. Basically, the business is split into growth, growth and product, pretty much. I mean, obviously, there's a whole operation as well. So I do the growth, Charlie does the product, and then we have a, a, an operations team as well. Um, and that's how it works. Yeah, so the you and I end up talking growth all the time. I don't deal as much with Charlie because I'm going to be useless talking about manufacturing, cleaning products, uh, and all that. But that is a, an important note that you guys are vertically integrated. So you're uh, well, or, or that you're you know, manufacturing yourself, and and uh, and so that's a big part of the business. Yeah, we formulated the products ourselves. We mix them, formulate them, we fill them, do all that manufacturing, and then we also do our fulfillment. Yeah. So that's a big part of the business and we could talk about how cash moves through that part of the business at some point. But actually what I think is really interesting for my audience and the main kind of things here is is to think more about sort of the, the customer acquisition and retention model that you guys have built. Now, let's like talk a little more about the product because you cannot talk about retention even with the subscription component without talking talking about the product itself and what makes it good. Like I've talked about this a lot of times, but besides subscription as this big lever, you know, product is the driver of retention and uh, above all that lots of other tactics can surround that and email and SMS and all those kinds of things. But but ultimately, uh, the product itself is this core part of it. So you just referenced a few elements that make the product unique, but let's talk a little bit more about what those might be. So you referenced non-toxic, so clean ingredients, the scents, the packaging, and then one product for all of the cleaning in your house. Did I, did I miss anything there? What, what are the things that people like love about this product that keeps them coming back and keeps them excited about it? If I had to package up what really is our big difference, it's the way you use our product, you understand that we've taken cleaning really seriously and that cleaning actually really matters and the product you re- use really matters. And so everything in our product has been so deeply thought about in a way that I, you know, the the category has not really had before. The category is basically bottom, lowest common denominator, price-driven type category. And we've approached it in this, in this very unique way. And you know, the main output of that really is the experience. So the scents are natural essential oils. They are beautifully blended by our in-house team to create almost very sophisticated, almost perfume level scent in the home, almost like a candle type scent. People really love that about the product. People love the sense. That's a big part of the acquisition strategy, but that's like a major, major component of it. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely massive, and it's really hard to you know, the formulation of those scents in terms of the blending, but also how they work with surfactants and natural surfactants without clashing and going off. It, it's, it's been it was a really hard task, and you know, no one else has really managed to master that. So that that's a big thing, and then the, the non-toxic thing's big, but just because some people use natural ingredients as surfactants, but no one has been able to do uh, the scent side in a non-toxic way. And synthetic scents are basically quite toxic, especially when you breathe them in; they go into your microbiome and gut. And so we've solved that, and so you don't cough when you clean uh, in the bathroom; it's, it feels very natural and nice. So that's another big thing. And then the sustainability piece is obviously massive. We we sell our cleaning products in concentrates. So our starter kit is like a uh, box with a bottle for life that looks lovely on the side, a lovely cloth that look, with a curling fig on it, and three concentrates in three different scents. And we can get onto how we got to this starter kit because it has a lot of implications on retention. Maybe we can show people that landing page really fast. Would you mind if we do that? Sure. Okay. And in fact, by the way, really fast before we do that, can, can you just give people a sense of kind of where the business is at scope wise, any metrics you want to say, I don't know, you know, some people want to, are cool saying revenue numbers, some people are not, but give a, a basic sense of where you guys are at. And it, you've, you cited some stats lately. I'm happy to. I mean, uh, we had our first year, we turned over a million pounds, second year turned over three and a half million pounds. And this year we're turning over 17 and a half million. So it's been massive growth rate, massive growth of the business where the, the growth is coming from really, really heavy customer acquisition. So we're, we're acquiring 20,000, 25,000 new subscribers every month um, at the moment. And that's just going to continue to grow. Yeah. And and the thing is, and we'll, we'll get to more of this, but the LTV is so massive that when you think about that jump from three and a half million pounds to 17 and a half million pounds, the, the forecasted future revenue is is like gigantic. I don't know if you, do, I don't know if you have a number on hand right now for what you're looking at for next year, but 
Yeah, fifty-four pitch four million next year. Yeah. yeah. So, so that level of growth rate to you know to go from three and a half million to seventeen and a half million pounds, and then to fifty-four million to like grow by that much again, is like ridiculous, and is only possible because the LTV is so good, which speaks to how much people love the product, which is why I wanted to start there. Is it profitable? Yes, I mean underlying it is profitable. But we do in, in, reinvest huge amounts of our profit into new customers. So we've got this dilemma with subscription so subscription brands. And it's basically, you know, if you wanted to, if you've turned off new customer acquisition with a subscription brand that's developed and has, you know, compounding cohorts going back, you can produce absolutely huge amounts of profit or just on the spot. As, you know, as long as your fixed cost base is significantly lower than your ex- existing customer contribution, then you're in a good place and you can produce profit. But really, as a subscription brand, you're not interested in profit. You're interested in, in this idea of future value. So what's the future value you're generating in a single month on a contribution basis? And so for us as a business, like a bad month is a profitable month. So if we myth our targets forecast on new customer acquisition, we make a ton of profit and that's a really bad month for us. And if we hit our growth targets for new customer, new customer acquisition. We make much less profit, but we know the future value we've generated, which you can't show on that month's PL because it wouldn't really wouldn't really make sense. But as long as you understand how that future profit and future value is going to work, then you're in a good good place. So the way we kind of break that down is we actually have three EBITDAs in our business. So we've got the kind of baseline normal EBITDA, which is, you know, the kind of thing you refer to probably when you ask the question. And we do like to make sure that at this stage of our business is on a, at profit. We've then got what we're calling existing customer EBITDA. So we're taking our existing customer contribution and we're monitoring our fixed cost base and looking at the EBITDA on that level, which is which is extremely healthy. And then we've got a third thing called steady state EBITDA, which is which is essentially the same thing, but accounting for churn. So you'd be saying, What's your churn rate? Let's say you're churning 5,000 customers a month. I'd have to invest. How much would you have to invest in in marketing to acquire 5,000 customers to keep your active customer base at the same size? And you take the contribution lost from those new customers you'd have to acquire off your EBITDA. And that's essentially saying, you know, if someone acquired this business, what would they pay on a multiple of the steady state EBITDA, which is just keeping the business as it is exactly even right yeah exactly even yeah 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 and and you've seen valuations off the subscription business based on that study state EBITDA number yeah we've seen we've seen lots yeah so okay so one of the things I want you to hear right there just to sort of bring in the narrator voice here for a second is just that Jack is thinking carefully about each of those and how those go those work through a subscription business and I want to put my finger on that right away because one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today Jack and one of the reasons I love working with you is because you are acquiring customers, as you just mentioned there, and kind of breezed over, but at a loss, and that you want to acquire customers at a loss at this point, but that you have you are really thinking carefully about why to do that. And this goes against some of the things that you hear kind of tossed around, and most businesses, by the way, should not do this. It is, this is an important thing. Some Somebody, when you were talking about like the notion that you're not, you're sort of profitable today, right? You actually, you actually do have baseline profitability today. So there's that. But when this notion that you actually don't want to be very profitable in an, in a one month period, that's bad for you to be too profitable. That, you know, there's somebody out there who's going like, yeah, but what about all birds? And what about, you know, all of the, you know, big examples of companies that just like, we're going to grow and grow and grow and went public and got these big valuations and then just tanked because they could actually never realize the profitability that they were promising along the way. Your business is different than that, in my opinion. And, and so, those examples loom large in people's heads as like sort of the venture backed model. By the way, are you guys, what's your capitalization? It's probably worth noting how you guys capitalized at the early stages of this. Yeah, I mean, we took some capital right at the beginning, but friends and family, though, right? Yeah, we haven't raised since. Yeah. So two, over two years ago, we took not much capital and it's basically bootstrapped from there. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you can't o- operate at a, such a massive loss because, you know, you've never had that kind of, it's not like you're venture backed or anything. So, those are the things. So let's actually walk through a little bit. You mentioned uh, a second ago, let's sort of unpack all of that now for people, uh, because that actually represents this whole notion of sort of 
what that forecast is and why you're acquiring at a loss and the way you're thinking about the valuation actually contains within it, and now we've talked about the product, contains within it the mechanisms of acquisition, of an offer, of your execution of that customer acquisition on your meta ads approach, and then into how you're thinking about the LTV cohorts and some of those kinds of things. So let's take that on the acquisition side first. We started to talk about that offer that you came to, and now I am going to share my screen here in just a second. Now, if you are listening to this and you're not watching it on YouTube, you could switch over to YouTube and you'll see the screen share here. If not, we will do our best, Jack and I will do our best to explain what's going on here. But this is the one of the landing pages that you've got. I'm going to I'm going to have a faux pas here, which is I'm going to well, show this. Let's, put up, let's pull up a different one. Uh, let's put up this one here. I'll just send you, send you the link. In the chat? Okay. Okay, so we've got the right landing page here, and now I'm going to share my screen. So again, we'll do our best to explain what uh, is going on with this and, and sort of how this landing page works and what the offer is especially. So you want to just kind of talk through this, Jack, and just tell me, tell me where you want to scroll? Yeah, I mean, just start with the with the with the package, so we can the messaging is is you know reasonably self explanatory. But if you go straight to the this page will be linked by the way in the show notes if you want to look at it. If you go to the buy box, that'll be most helpful. If you just press get offer, basically. Yep, we're there. Yep, yep, yeah. So you got it. So this is our this is our hero hero skew basically. So um, what you can see here is. Uh, a bottle for life and three concentrates which are in different stents or flavors and you can see in the bullet points here you get three refills for a 90 days reply, supply you get them delivered quarterly on the subscription and there's a big offer of 50 50 percent off to sign up for this quarterly subscription now we have some upsells down down the funnel so this this aov ends up being being about 22 pounds you know after all the upsells and our CAC on this is about 15, 15 pounds. So, you know, we're making seven pounds on the on on the, yeah, on that difference between CAC and revenue, but we obviously have cost. So we end up making a small net contribution loss on this this starter kit. Now, we have had models that make us contribution profit on first order, but there's there's a reason why we ended up scaling this model. And I I just like yeah, I can dive into basically how we came came about this model. Let's talk a little bit more about the offer itself. So you've got you've got the bottle itself that you say is the is the free bottle, like the spray bottle, and then and then you've got the three different scents that are are part of it in the initial offer. Do you want to talk about how you came to that offer of bottle plus three cents with like you know again framing it as fifty percent off? Yeah, no, exactly. So if if you break down what we did is we broke down subscription into its into its first principles and we kind of looked at what are the core components. You've got the frequency of the subscription, you've got the price of the subscription, and the contents itself. And kind of orthodoxy would say on a subscription, you want to have as many deliveries as possible, go for a monthly subscription, try and get as much in there as possible for the highest value. Mm -hmm. But what we tried to do is think slightly differently about it. And we played with lots of different frequencies. We played with one month, two month, three month, four month, five month, and six month. We played with having three different scents, three of the same scents, a mixture where you could choose. And we played with different price points as well. And essentially what we landed on, we did that right at the start and then we kind of applied Occam's razor and we just cut away at anything that basically didn't work. So any model that had a too high a CPA that had a big, massive first contribution loss, or then we cut away at models that didn't produce the proper retention that we wanted. And essentially over time, when we let these, the, the different models play out, on a cohort basis, it was really clear that by providing three different scents, you gave customers the opportunity to find the scent they loved. By doing a quarterly subscription, they never got overstocked with product. And so when it came to their their next order, they were very much looking forward to the special treat of their, of their per diem fig coming. And we, we managed to retain customers on an incred incredibly high basis with that model. And then with the discount, we, we basically tested lots of discounts and 50% just simply produced the best delta between essentially your CPA cost and your contribution profit or uh, variable cost profit on the on the purchase and it, it made many people go can't believe you're doing a 50% discount on your first order but it was a very simple 
you know, basic calculation, basic mathematical looking at that, you know, you could try and get another five pounds from customers on the first order. You get 20, you make it 20 pounds. But we found our customer base were very sensitive to higher price points when they didn't know the product, they hadn't tried the product. And so just a five pound increase in, in revenue in your first order would lead to a much larger increase in CAC than the contribution profit you're getting from that extra five pounds. So it just doesn't, it didn't make sense you know, to, to try and increase the price. And so then what we had is basically this formula between lowest possible CAC, highest possible LTV, and we basically just scaled that out. Hey, let me interrupt this conversation to say that right now I can tell you with certainty because I've been in the conversation that Jack himself is considering adding excellent e-commerce talent to his business from the Philippines. He's looking at it on the creative side of his business. That is definitely a place you can look to hire excellent, talented people in the Philippines. And my recommendation for the place to do that is with my friends at More Staffing. By going to morenow.co, you can get set up in the interview process to recruit train, onboard, all of the things involved with hiring incredible e-commerce talent in the Philippines all across your business. That includes the creative side of the business, design, editing, that sort of thing. It also includes supply chain operations. They're just incredibly talented people who are in the Philippines who would be great hires for your business who come at a much lower cost than hiring that same talent in the US or the UK as the case may be. And my friends at More Staffing are the people to help you do that. As they say, Hiring a virtual assistant can be useful, helpful in your business. But hiring virtual professionals can be transformative. They know it because they have run e-commerce businesses themselves with large teams from the Philippines. So they understand the details of exactly how to find the right people, onboard them, get them integrated. And it has been really, really good for businesses that they have personally run. Go, if you are looking to add talent to your business, seriously consider doing that with my friends at More Staffing. Tell them I sent you. Go to morenow.co to get that process started today. Yeah, I just love that. I love that way of thinking about things. And even the notion of like a lot of people say, you know, 50% off, oh, that's so bad. But, you know, this is exactly the kind of thing that I think applies all over your business, which is like a lot of people say as a way of guiding your business would not be a good way to guide your business. But you guys have aggressively tested these things and you measure them over time and you make really sure that it's like actually right for you and for your business and your customer. One of the things I would have been nervous about with the 50% off offer up front was the value of those customers over a longer period of time. You know, are you just going to get a bunch of people who are really, really price sensitive and who, you know, just came for the discount or whatever? But that has not been true. You have found these customers are exceptionally valuable. Do you want to talk? Before we talk about the value of those customers over time, let's actually talk more about the acquisition method. So once you guys have locked on that offer, let's note sort of what you have done to scale your spend against that offer. And then we could talk about the measurement and making sure that sort of the LCVs work out over time. But you know, now you're talking about getting towards a mid 50 pound, 50 million pound business. That's US. That's what, like 70, $75 million. You know, you're, you're talking about building a really big business next year. You're already over that sort of going to be this year over that US $20 million mark. How have you guys gone about actually scaling acquisition against that, against that offer once you've kind of landed on what the offer is? Well, I mean, just really quickly, just, just to finish off, finish off that previous point about a lot of people say is... Uh, yeah, big value in our business is, is thinking from first principles. So, if you break anything down to its component parts and just try and and try and just work it out, you're gonna you get a lot further often than taking orthodoxy from people around you, and it, it really does get you a long way. It's amazing how many of the decisions you make in a business are very contextual to your exact circumstance. So any received wisdom should should either be tested or or just thought about in those terms. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of what's interesting about that, Jack, really fast, is that that in some ways sounds almost arrogant because like, oh, you don't listen to other people or something like that. I, well, it doesn't it doesn't sound arrogant, but I can imagine somebody taking it that way. Like, oh, come on, you know, but actually, like, I think it's one of those things where like the willingness to test is a reflection of sort of humility as an operator, which is that like, of course, it, I could be wrong. Why don't I just test it and find out before I go do that? And you're you're also impressively patient with your tests. I've noticed like you'll you'll run an acquisition test, check the offer and you have a hunch that like maybe this customer will be especially valuable to you. Like I know we've talked about sort of changing it so that people will start with like a double subscription to start or whatever. And so there's this hunch. Well, if they're, subscri if they're subscribed to two products instead of one in the beginning, then they'll be more valuable long-term than my past cohorts. And you and I have looked at this and talked about, you know, changing that offer and doing that. And it's possibly true, but your, you know, your business is moving along really nicely. You're going at this exceptional rate. So there's no reason to potentially 
to start throwing all your chips in on that until you've seen. No, 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 that's actually right. We, we can we can make sure this is working and and it's it's performing great. You know, so I love that about the way that you that you, you operate things, especially when you're talking about this kind of deal, which is this sort of like acquisition offer approach. Test it, figure out what works, go from there. And you're taking big tests. You're not changing button colors. You're talking about changing the offer. You know, changing the offer, which is a big deal because you've got to you've got to understand you know the impact on the LTV. Or you can't just look at the CPI impact. But the the whole that whole way of thinking is is basically the reason when we first started we couldn't we we really couldn't acquire customers and we were struggling and it was thinking from first principles about how people buy cleaning products and the cost of cleaning products versus the cost of our product the the hump the mental hump they'd have to get over to to try and spend that kind of money and then thinking about leaning into what's really valuable in cleaning which is once you find a product you like you're going to use it for a long time that kind of first principle leaning into that and building it around a subscription you know loss on first purchase type model doesn't have to be always subscription but you know in this case it was that's what allowed us to unlock the the scale and we always had a great product i was trying to i was thinking like everyone else was thinking you know with these very you know, grid lines you have to do it a certain way have to be high aov profitable in first order you know and anything else is a bonus that was kind of my mindset couldn't get anywhere but then as soon as we start thinking about the actual customer journey and how they interact with the products you start building the model around that and it, and it took off yeah that's so good the high ov one's another great one it's something that people love to talk about is how important it is to get a high aov and i, I have, i'm so convinced that aov is the most overrated overrated data point in e-commerce like there are great like high aov can be great but it can also not be great for all kinds of reasons and what really matters is contribution margin, and uh, and so yeah. So if if you can actually produce that AOV and high contribution margin without having to pay a bunch of advertising, then great. Actually, though, I think that there's some ways in which a lower AOV is a massive advantage in e-commerce, especially in the early stages. And so anyway, I don't want to get too derailed on that, but it's, but a, it's a perfect the, example. You where can get that. You can get the data through. It's much easier with lower AOV. Much easier. Yeah. Yeah. And it typically, a lot of times, to that the lower AOV represents a better repeat customer who has more value on the back end on the returning customer side, which is where all the contribution margin is. And so typically higher AOV, if it's, especially if it's higher AOV, less total orders per customer, you're going to pay a bunch of dollars on the new customer acquisition. And you're going to actually eat into all that contribution margin the AOV produces. So it can create a real problem because if you don't have high LTV with it, it, it doesn't necessarily work that well. Okay. So how did you scale the acquisition? You actually solved it to some degree, and now you're scaling acquisition. Now you're scaling acquisition a whole bunch more than you ever have before. You're seeing continued record months of customer acquisition. What was the what what unlocked that? Well, we worked with we working with the kinship team for a long time now, probably almost coming on two years. Uh, well, probably now, actually eighteen months basically, and they've been fantastic partners. So you might have heard of them. I'm not sure you have, but they do. They help with influencer seeding which is a great way to to build awareness in your target audience and then also you know, generate huge volumes of content to put into to meta so that's kind of yeah how we got going really in terms of getting that volume of content through which was you know, basically testing a huge amount of different things because they were producing two or three hundred assets when we were a very small team and that was that was really fantastic but then as we kind of scaled up spend obviously on the creative side We've now built an in-house team that that produces slightly different types of creative that are targeting angles. You and sort of learned what more. works off of all that initial testing, and and actually produced it. But it's just worth putting our finger on there that that it's like a meta ads driven approach via wide range of testing. And you know, initially they did the influencer seeding stuff. There's some pretty good evidence that that seeding has produced a bunch of awareness, which has made your meta account perform better, even aside from the value of the creative in the account. Kinship actually has some super interesting data about that. We'll link them here as well because I think they should get some credit here for being a really good partner to you. They've done a really good job. I've looked closely at that ad account, and you know, shout out Nick Bauer, who's I know running your your ad account and uh, on that on that Kinship team, and yeah, he's awesome. And so they've done a really, really, really good job. And some of their data around the way that actual influencer posts and seeding has produced value at the back end of the ad account level is super interesting. How many influencers have posted at this point for you guys? Or like, what's the number of posts? 
Oh God! I mean, it will be in the in literally in the forty five or six thousand influencers that post about us in the last twelve months. Five or six thousand influencers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that, that some of those are posting a couple times. So you're looking at eight to ten thousand posts, something like that. Oh Is that God, right? yeah, at least yeah, yeah, something like that. Well, I've actually got I've got a funny story about kinship. So when we first started working, I was running the ad account, and it was at a time when we were starting to build some traction, and you know things were working nicely, and so I was very precious about running the ad account and. They uh, they run a very kind of a very bullish on cost cap a cost cap approach and a very certain way of doing things, and I'm um, yeah I fancy myself for a bit of a media buyer. So I was like, look, you can do the seeding and I'll do the run the ad account, and then if you want to, you know, run some campaigns alongside me, you can. We can see how they perform. So we did that for about six or seven months. Um, me doing a more traditional approach and them doing their approach, and I was like fighting for dear life to hold on but you know their their approach was incredibly efficient and over about six six months proved they proved that it, it, it worked this you know, using basically using cost caps and we won't go into detail their approach but yeah it, it worked it worked very well well but it's worth noting again that you you've done something really important which is you've measured the precise contribution margin goal and value of your customers and then given a very clear target back to kinship for what number you want to hit. And then they just take that and say, okay, great. They run cost caps and they run the account. They've been very public about this and about like, they're going to push that creative through and without getting into the entire setup of the account, it's just worth noting that once they have that clear target, because you've done the hard work, and this is something I talk about all the time of measuring clearly the value of your customer for you and what kind of profitability target, what kind of profitability threshold you want to create. Then they just pump that through cost caps. You know, you obviously you've heard me say I my preference would be actually that we move towards bid caps, but that's okay. Cost caps is not really my enemy. Like if you're running cost caps at this, like that's like that's a very a good approach overall. And by doing that, they've been able to just like essentially launch tons of stuff and scale, scale, scale and keep growing that ad spend because it's just like if Meta can spend as much as possible at your number, it really works. But the key thing is like the cost caps are part of the way that you actually execute this plan. But the measurement and the clarity to the target between both unit economics on first purchase and future purchases, and then the cohort value and the cohort measurement is what enables you to use that strategy really effectively. Because by knowing exactly the target, you can punch that into your cost cap number. Here's exactly what CAC number we want. And then boom, you get as much spend there as possible measure it both in platform and at the AMER kind of level, new customer revenue, watching that really, really carefully. And by doing those things, then you then you can really, really effectively maximize that platform. Whether it's their seeding content or it's influencers or creative that you guys produce, all of those, you know, you've seen lots of different stuff work and mostly now it's creative that you guys are producing. So, you know, it's not really about that per se, but you've locked the offer. You're still testing some offers and now you've been able to kind of move that forward. And I, I think it's like, sort of a perfect execution of of how you can use those strategies to really, really effectively scale a business once you know the numbers. Yeah, no, it's absolutely right. And then the, the second part of that, which is it's critical for a subscription brand, uh, if, for those that are doing doing them or thinking about them, is because you've got this, this lag, this compounding, well, you've got compounding existing customer revenue from previous cohorts, but there's a lag, there's a lag. So you can't scale up ad spend too quickly because you know, suddenly your MER is going to go through the roof if you don't let the cohorts come through at those higher higher ad spend levels. So you know, if we jump from spending half a million pound a month to a million pound a month, uh, we've spent uh, on ads, we spend an extra 500k on ads that month, but the cohort where we spent the 500k are going to come through for three months and then give us that the, the big chunk of returning customer revenue, which is you know the the seventy or eighty percent of customers that stay with us for that second order. So, you know, you've got to basically have your CAC target very clear, and then you need to have 70, 70 to eighty percent of customers stay with you for that second order. That is a big number. Yeah. So, okay, keep going. So, so you've got to have the CAC target, but then you've got to have a very, very for your cash flow um, management. You've got to have a very clear ad spend forecast, which bakes in you know all the previous cohorts. And what they're going to do on, on the returning customer revenue and contribution, so you can clearly see you know, what you can invest without basically bankrupting the business in in future value in that month. And so you've also got to think carefully about those dynamics. The final thing I'll say with that is I think that's a really useful constraint. And growing ad spend in that kind of way, where we we basically grow ad spend, 
very in a very linear way it'll be you know 30 to 50k added every single month and i think that creates real advantages when it comes to maintaining efficiency with your cac targets and also allowing facebook to to do full funnel targeting so that you know if you if you suddenly scale from 500,000 to a million pound on spend what facebook will essentially do is it will just try and convert all the people that are most likely to convert in your whole funnel whereas if you grow it more more steadily your facebook will continue to build your top of funnel audience and continue to build that awareness in people who kind of just see an ad once or twice and so your efficiency targets will will stay in, intact and i think that's a, a very it's been a very nice constraint for us in terms of the efficiency i think the constraint there that's it's sort of more interesting is that by by what you're essentially doing is you're saying we want the returning customers with all the contribution margin they produce to fund our acquisition over time but to accomplish that we have to wait now this is where measuring the value of those returning customers has been really crucial ha so well, let's actually come back to that point in a second but let's talk about that you know for a fact that your customers are exceptionally valuable that 70 to 80 percent number is through the roof in terms of not churning that means people love this product they're excited to get it etc but what what is it that makes it so that customers or what what have you done to measure the value of those customers over time and to know those cohorts are going to come through and create value because the place where you are most likely to get destroyed in this process is that you acquire these customers at a loss, like you've said, but then the value doesn't actually come through and you don't actually produce additional value on it. So convince me that you have done the work to make sure that's not going to happen in this business because it's the thing everybody's worried about with, with taking the strategy. Convince me of that and, and tell, tell people how you did that. How did you actually get that information? So the really quickly just jump on that, on that second point, which is how do you know the lifetime value is going to come through? Well, obviously you've got an evidence base. And that evidence base is essentially the repeatability of, of your lifetime value and your retention, basically to the point where you can predict almost you know, to, the, to the percentage point how every single cohort you've acquired in the past is going to behave when it comes to their quarterly order. And by that, I mean, you know, you take, if you think about you know, taking the last two years of data, you take every single cohort, 24 cohorts, and you, and you basically plot in the month of June exactly the retention rate across all 24 cohorts in that month of June. And you know, if you do that and you're correct enough times, which is you know basically where we're at. You know, we've done that you know for six months now across all those cohorts. We predicted almost to the T exactly what's going to happen. Then you start to build confidence in in the evidence there. Now, the tricky thing and the thing that gets the reason what, why, and I've thought very deeply about why subscription brands have had a problem with this lifetime value. And the, the, the tricky thing is, if you acquire a cohort that's so big that if it behaves differently for whatever reason, it might be the offer you brought them in on, it might be the time of the year, the product quality, something went wrong, the delivery time was slow. If, if anything goes wrong with that cohort and they're, they're too big, that's a headshot risk to your, to your cash flows. And what we've noticed is as we've grown, we've got the chance to acquire 20, we, we, if we wanted in July, we could acquire 40,000 customers. Now, the reason we're not acquiring 40,000 customers is because we have a total of 130,000 subscriptions right now, active subscriptions. That would be a third of our total subscriptions in one cohort if we acquired 40,000 customers. Now, for us, that risk is just, because the growth rate is so, so massive, you know, that risk is just too big. You know, if that cohort behaves differently, the financial health of our business would dramatically change. And if we did that for three months in a row, it would be really dangerous to the, to the overall cash flows. So I think that the brands that scaled incredibly aggressively, venture funded, you know, their cohort sizes were just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and were stacking on top of each other. And there will be a point when it, when it changes. And you just when it does change, you need to adjust your strategy and plans. And if you don't, you know, if you don't have the time to do that because you've already acquired the customers, you know, it's it, you start to get this, yeah, you, know, you start to get all sorts of problems, which I won't, I won't dive into now. But you know, basically, massive churn problems where your business starts constricting because your churn is bigger than your new customers coming in, and it's a feature of basically growing too fast. So a mixture of having this very clear data on all previous cohorts and then not creating too much risk in any single cohort you acquire. You know, it basically gives you the confidence. 
That's so good, man. That's so helpful. Can we talk quickly about sort of what you're doing on a week by week basis to measure that? Because what you've now talked about is essentially the setup on the front end. You're, you're, you're building a cohort based forecast, which I've talked about a lot on this podcast. You're carefully measuring your unit economics and thinking about the value of a customer relative to contribution margin relative to unit economics and LTV, building that all into that forecast. And then you're tracking it and making sure that it doesn't work. And you actually created something that I've since used with other clients. So thank you. I've adjusted it some, but um, you created something as a way to to sort of keep an eye on this week over week because because like you just said, there's this potential headshot risk. So if that happens, you need to know about it as fast as possible to mitigate it. And so you've created this spreadsheet and I'll pull up a sort of different version of it with dummy numbers in here, by the way. So just, just so everybody's clear, these are not Jack's numbers that you're about to see. They're not anybody's numbers. I just made them up. And so I'll pull up this spreadsheet that we look at. You send it out in a weekly email to me that we go through on coaching calls and those kinds of things to just sort of talk through where the business is at. Here you go. This weekly dashboard template it includes a whole bunch of stuff. Again, if you're not watching this, if you're just listening, we've got a few key elements of it. Jack, do you want to talk through what you see here? Or do you want me to talk through it? Yeah, no, I'm, ha- I'm happy to. I mean, basically, yeah, we since we started creating this weekly dashboard, which you know, essentially has you know your, all your most important metrics and KPIs in it, and you just plot it against your monthly forecast, you know, to basically make sure that um, yeah, everything is in order and, and nothing is, is getting out of whack. It's an incredibly helpful tool. I mean, partly because it stops you checking all the numbers every four hours, which can be a big distraction for founders. But it also allows you to just find, you know, notice big trends. You're like, oh, we missed this three weeks in a row. And you can you can really start to to feel that quite closely. It just keeps you very close to numbers. It's It's really handy. Yeah. The key, so the key ones here, you've got weekly revenue, AOV, you know, those things can be helpful. And then contribution margin right there at the top. So you have a sense of your weekly actual contribution margin and revenue relative to targets. And there's sort of two columns here. There's the actual and then there's a forecast for that week. So that means that you have to have a forecast target for that week, by the way, for this to work. So you know what you're supposed to do this week, and then you've got an actual against it. You've got your variance as well. So you but see you can that. Just divide, you can just divide your monthly forecast by... 30 and times by seven if you, if you want. Yeah. Which is what I do, which is exactly what I do for these. So so I'm not actually building a weekly forecast per se. I'm just sort of straight lining uh, monthly ones, which creates some stuff. You know, if you know you're going to have a sale one day or something like that, then you know, okay, that the straight lining my monthly forecast into four weeks or, you know, 4.3 weeks is is not exactly right, but that's okay. You, you know, those things are happening in your business. You're getting close enough to it at this point. And then you've got ad spend in there. So you know exactly what you're spending, exactly what the revenue is. Again, you've got a forecast for your spend. So, you know, if you're over or under that, under that spend, in this case, I've got my conditional formatting set so that if you're under spend, it's formatted, it's red, and it's not green because you actually want to get through all of that spend. And if you're under spend, something might've gone right as long as you're over revenue or over new customer revenue, but it also might've gone wrong. Maybe you should have spent more. It just depends on your inventory position, et cetera. So um, you wanna be hitting that spend number. And then crucially, crucially, returning customer revenue is forecasted and actualized every single week. And this to me is one of the ways to protect against the problem that everybody sees coming with acquiring customers at a loss, which is, yeah, but what if those cohorts don't come through? If they don't come through, we will know it very, very fast. And this is true in a subscription business or not a subscription business. I do this with, I have a client that has a quite low LTV all told, and we still look at this number every single week because we want to know how these these uh, cohorts are coming in relative to their forecast. And we do a cohort-based forecast either way because I just want to make sure that we're we're on top of exactly these kinds of numbers. And by having a returning customer revenue number in there, we'll know if suddenly our returning customer revenue number is much lower than our forecast. And if our, if our sort of net active subscribers number is much uh, lower than it should be, then you've got problems and, and you need to go address them. So we're taking at the top line what the revenue and contribution margin is for the week, but then we're breaking that out into returning retention and acquisition components of this. So you've got returning customer revenue and subscribers and then new customer revenue, uh, AMER and sub- and like a projected customer contribution margin LTV off the customers that you're acquiring, right? So if I'm acquiring, you know, if I need to do a hundred, in this case, it shows if, if, I, if I'm if i forecasted for $105,000 in revenue, I actually did 105, 612, then what's my contribution margin off of that? Well, you just calculate that by multiplying by how much gross margin you have and then subtracting out multiplying that by the few, by the LTV forecast that you have, right? So if I expect, in this case, I think I've got it set so that it would be like 50% growth over the course of a year. So if somebody spends $100 today, they spend another 50 over the course of the year. 
and then subtracting out ad spend. And so in real time, you have a sense of not only what is my contribution margin today, but what is the projected contribution margin of the customers that I acquired in the last week as well. And that should keep you aligned up. Now that means week to week, we are looking at new customer revenue, returning customer revenue, plus our contribution margin actualized and our forecasted contribution margin off the customers we've acquired this week. If you do that every single week, if you break those things down every single week as the operator of your business, it will be very, very hard to get in trouble, especially if you add one last thing in your forecast, which is your OPEX. As long as you're forecasting and, and maintaining discipline around your OPEX, you should be in really good shape to be able to know exactly where profitability is. That's everything. We've now covered the entire PL. We've got our ad spend. We've got our COGS basically built into that contribution margin level. And we've got our OPEX. If you are tracking those three things, forecasting them, and then measuring your performance week over week in a D2C e-commerce business, you are going to have a very hard time getting really off track. And you can make adjustments very, very quickly. I also should note that I prefer you sort of working with you, Jack, has led me to be to really prefer doing this on a weekly basis and not a daily basis. There's all kinds of reasons for that. But uh, but basically, I think daily just gives you too much reason to make adjustments too fast. And, and actually, you want to see, you want to allow some sample sizes to grow. You want to see day of the week effects work themselves out and some of that, right? If you're running cost caps or bid caps, you'll see bigger weekends and slower weekdays a lot of times. And so daily can actually throw you off if you're straight lining your projections, et cetera. So doing that on a weekly basis has been like an incredibly good way. And I found it to be incredibly useful for lots of people. Now, if we sort of put all that together and you've got unit economics, cohort-based forecasting, and that to track each week very, very simply, man, you've got the basis for like building a really, really good business. I see. And then also just thinking, thinking really carefully about, about the risk of the, the risk, basically risk on cohorts, risk on new offers just being very aware that the only thing that could really screw you is getting your, getting your lifetime value wrong and your lifetime contribution wrong if you're losing money on first order. And so don't scale a new offer, don't scale a new bundle or way of buying to the moon and uh, just until you've got the data to, to prove that it works as well. And that's on obviously a contribution basis and really strip out all variable costs and don't kid yourself as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't kid yourself. That's good. Last thing here, Jack, and then uh, and then we can wrap up. Why take the additional risk of acquiring customers at a loss? If these customers are this valuable to you, what is the point of acquiring customers? Why not just be super profitable all the way? Because that's really the difference, right? Like, why not just say like, no, we're going to acquire customers profitability and we're going to, you know, sort of focus on profitability and just be super profitable all the way. So we're maybe break even on first purchase and then profitable after or even make a little bit of money on first purchase. What is the answer to that question? Why take the risk at all? Well, it's just a mathematical answer. I mean, it's a worse model for our business. You know, it's the value perception and cleaning paired, you know, trying to match that with higher AOVs will not lead to very good, a scalable business model where you can, you know, make a serious amount of contribution profit from, you know, introducing Returning new customers. customers. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's actually not, if, if, if you're thinking carefully about this stuff in your business, it shouldn't really be a choice. It, it's kind of like, I, well, I, just, I, I love Jeff, Jeff Bezos a lot and take a lot of our, my like uh, operating principles from him. But basically in Amazon, there are decisions that require judgment and decisions that, that are just obvious based on data. And you know, 90% of the decisions are just obvious based on data and you don't need to try and use your judgment, which is judgment is a, there's been a whole book written on judgment and it's an incredibly complicated topic philosophically. And yes, you can have good judgment, bad judgment, but basically if you don't have to use your judgment and you can use data, you're much better off. And for us, this was a data, data driven decision. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe an even simpler sentence is that you'd be costing yourself tens of millions of pounds or dollars if you were acquiring customers, right? Like, yeah, because you might not even be able to acquire them. You probably won't be able to acquire them. Yeah. And, and so and so it's like, it's a sort of very obvious that you should do this. So, all right. Anything else you want to give people at the end here? Go ahead. I would just say it's um, it's also not, it's actually not that complicated as well. So understanding your, your CAC's LTV, tripling out variable costs, looking at contribution profit, using softwares to look at retention and all that stuff and tracking these numbers in a weekly spreadsheet that you just showed, it's actually not rocket science. So if you again, you know, don't be so yeah, don't be too scared by the by the thought of it and the fact that it's not commonly done. Just think about what's best for your business and 
and just do the fundamentals, these fundamentals, and, and, it, and it can work and it can scale very nicely. Love that. All right, Jack, thank you so much. Anything, any last little bits, anything that we didn't get to that you wanted to make sure people hear or anything like that? No, no, all good, Andrew. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. In fact, I hope it was a bit useful. Okay. No, it's very useful. I think this is one of the best episodes we've done, actually. I think it's really, really strong. Lots of really good tactical and strategic stuff here that can, I think, really help people. So awesome. Where can people find you if they want to follow you and uh, hear more from your journey? You've been you've been pretty awesome about sharing stuff. Yeah, I'm on Twitter, Jack Rubin one Yeah, hit me up on Twitter. Get, get in touch if you want to ask any questions. And um, I, I post, you know, I, I do tweet a bit about decisions we're making and strategy so yeah give it a follow link is in the show notes of course thanks again jack for giving us your time you get a lot less out of this than people who get to listen to you so it's gracious of you to give your time in terms of uh, in terms of the benefit to you versus seller so thanks again and i'm uh, look, oh, looking forward to talking to you what next week for a weekly call next week yeah Bye. All right. I hope that was helpful to you. I really do think that was one of the better episodes I've recorded, to be honest with you, because Jack was so generous with the information involved, as well as his articulation of his strategy and how we got to where he got to. All those things I just think are so useful. You can hear the thoughtfulness behind the decisions he's made, the clarity to it. And I can just tell you, I've looked at this business very closely. All of that has really worked to create an incredibly valuable e-commerce business that I am extremely bullish on for the future. So yes, Jack is awesome. Uh, if you are in the UK, get yourself some pretty and fig. Definitely go give him a follow on Twitter, as he said. That's uh, at Jack Rubin one and that link is in the show notes. That will uh, He's a great follow. He does lots of other generous sharing on Twitter about what's going on in his journey, and, and the Kinship guys are doing the same kind of thing there. All the links, including to Kinship, to that landing page I mentioned, all of that stuff is in the show notes, uh, his Twitter feed, all those things are there. Along with, don't forget that you can also get all the other things in my Twitter feed. That includes a link out to my sponsor for this episode, More Staffing, who I absolutely love. Virtual assistants can be helpful to your business. Virtual professionals can be transformative. Go hire great e-commerce talent in the Philippines with my friends at More Staffing. Go do that. It will be useful to you if you are growing your business. And uh, also, of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Andrew J. Ferris. You can email me about this or any other episode we've done, podcast at ajfgrowth.com. And if you want to look at ways to work with me and those sorts of things. I don't really have any space right now, but you can go check ajfgrowth.com, get on a waiting list, that sort of thing, and reach out to me if you're interested when space does open up. As always, I really appreciate a subscription. When you subscribe on YouTube or whatever podcast app that you're listening to this on, and even more than that, what would really be great would not only be a rating and review, but would be if you would share this with a friend who would also get value out of it. That would be, if you liked this content, that would be the number one way you could say thanks to me. So, That's it for this week. I hope that I will see you next time. I've got more great stuff coming. So definitely subscribe and I'll see you then.